So I want to talk about a topic that is really completely magical, um, which is the growth function. And we're going to give you the first bound for uncountably infinite spaces. Okay, so scientists who are working on this problem, they, you know, they, when they were working with infinite function spaces, they were thinking, well, how can, how can we reduce this to dealing with some quantity that's finite? Right? So how do we reduce an infinite number of functions into a finite number of classifiers? And the answer was to look at how the functions classify the data. Because that amount of data is finite. So the amount of ways you can classify it is finite. So if you think about some data there, um, you can classify it in a whole bunch of different ways, but like that number is finite because you know either each point gets classified as positive or it gets classified as negative, and there's just not an infinite number of those possibilities. Okay, now the way that the data are actually distributed in the space here uh, really matters because under some configurations of the data, we can classify it in more ways. So for example, if I have these three points and I make them collinear, so I put them in a line, then I can classify them in a few different ways, but there are some ways I can never classify them. Like if I wanted to make the first and the third point positive and the second point negative, I can never do that here because they're collinear. And same thing if I put the data points all right on top of each other, then either they're all positive or they're all negative, right? So if you, if you, if you spread these data points out, then depending on where you put them, you can classify in more ways. Right. If you put the if they put them in the if you put these three points in a line, well, you can never you can never classify them in all possible ways. But if you put them in this sort of triangular shape, then you can classify them in all possible all possible ways. So the configuration of points here really matters. So I wanted to find this. Um, I wanted to find f z one to z n. So um, uh, so given z one to z n, I want to consider that thing which is the set of ways the data can be classified by functions from f, okay? So it's the set of all ways that these functions can be classified, and that is finite, no matter if I have an infinite set of functions. That's the, that's the cool thing. Okay, so the growth function of the function class f is the maximum number of ways into which endpoints can be classified by the function class, okay? So the growth function says you take the data, it's, it's, the, okay, it's the number of ways you can classify the data using functions from the class if the data is in the best possible configuration. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. So it's the number of ways into which endpoints can be classified using functions from the class if the data is in the best possible configuration to allow the most number of classifications. It's like the data were handed to you on a silver platter so that you could best classify them with functions from the class, right? It's like a chef arranging the food on the plate so that you could best get at it with your knife no matter which subset of food you wanted to eat. Okay, maybe that wasn't a good analogy, but uh, you get the idea. Okay, so I wanna give you some examples and specifically I wanna talk about half spaces in two dimensions. So these are binary functions whose decision boundary is a line. And I've been drawing these all along during this video, so there's nothing new here. All right, so the growth function for one point is two. So there's only two ways you can classify one point. It's either positive or negative, fine. And I wrote also two to the one because there's a pattern here and I want you to see it. Okay, so the growth function for two points is actually four because there's four different ways you can classify two points. So either they're both positive, they're both negative, or yeah, one or the other. That's two to the two. The growth function for three points is, you guessed it, eight. And there's all eight ways you can classify three points. And you see I put them here in the best possible configuration, which is that triangle there. I didn't put them all in a line and I didn't put them all on top of each other. Okay, and so uh, yeah, so that's uh, two to the three. And so hopefully you're seeing the pattern here. And so if I say to you, okay, what's the growth function for four points? Um, if you don't think about it too carefully, you might say two to the fourth, but actually it's not two to the fourth. I'm not gonna tell you what it is. I'll let you do that one for homework, but I will tell you it's less than two to the fourth and I'll tell you why. It's because no matter how you put the points, no matter what configuration you put the points in, you can never get the diagonals in one class while the other two points are in the other class. No matter what you do, no matter what configuration you put them in, you can never classify these four points in every possible way. Just can't happen. Okay, 
So you're starting to see that the growth function it sort of seems to increase exponentially and then it sort of maybe flattens out a bit. You know, it doesn't continue that exponential forever. And you can imagine that for five points, it's you know, definitely not two to the five, right? Okay, cool. So um, the growth function is in some sense the, the way we're gonna measure the capacity of a set of functions, right? It's like how powerful the set of functions is for modeling data. And you could imagine that a more powerful function class would be able to handle four points in, in 2D, right? If you had loops or circles or something like that, you could handle all four points. All right, so the growth function is, is a measure of capacity. Okay, so here's the theorem. This is, this is the theorem you've been waiting for. This is the first theorem that, that I've given you that actually handles infinite function classes. And the way it does it is using the growth function, which as you know, is always finite. Okay, now you, you, you already know Vapnik because he invented the support vector machine. Um, I know Vapnik personally. I have served as his chauffeur on several occasions, um, which was kind of fun. And I have a couple stories about him, but probably I shouldn't tell some of them in public. Uh, in any case, um, anywho, yeah, amazing guy. And uh, onto this incredible theorem. Okay, so um, this theorem by, by Vladimir here. It says uh, for any delta that's greater than zero, okay, with high probability, with respect to the random draw of data for all functions in the class, the true risk is less than the empirical risk plus some stuff. And that stuff is finite. Even if the function class is infinite, the growth function is finite. Okay, that's the magic of this lovely theorem. Um, so instead of the log m term we had in the Occam's razor bound, now we have the growth function. And interestingly, the growth function, um, this, this, the growth function is, is, is finite. And it, this is, here, let me tell you why it's cool. Okay, the theorem is non-vacuous, even for things like lines in the plane. It's an infinite number of lines in the plane. Um, the theorem is non-vacuous for, even for infinite function spaces like lines in the plane. And it's actually strictly better than the Occam's razor bound because, you know, um, the, growth, the growth function has to be smaller, right? The growth function has to be smaller than the total number of classifiers because the growth function measures, right, it's the number of ways you can classify data. You can't classify data more than the number of classifiers you have available. So the growth function has to be less than or equal to the total number of classifiers. And in the Occam's razor bound, we had M in that spot where the growth function was. So this bound is actually strictly better, okay? Except for maybe there's a constant there that's a little different. Like, I don't know if you see that four there, maybe a two, but uh, let's not worry about constants here. We'll just worry about the, in the important quantities, which of course for here are the growth function and the, and the number of data points here. Okay, so those are the, the important things we wanna, we wanna consider, right? The, the use of the growth function to measure the capacity of a set of functions, um, so the simplicity of a set of functions, the complexity of a set of functions, that's all measured by the growth function. And, um, and you know, of course, the fact that this stuff still goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Um, and then and when that happens, the empirical risk is close to the true risk. All right, thank you.